Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Circular Metabolism podcast. I'm your host, Aristide, from Metabolism of Cities. In this podcast, we interview researchers, thinkers, policymakers, and practitioners to better understand the metabolism of our cities and how to reduce their environmental impact in a socially just and context-specific way. In the last episodes, we explored some alternative societal and economic models, such as degrowth, living well within limits, permacircularity, and we continue our quest by looking into post-growth. Today is a special day. I have the pleasure to talk with Tim Jackson about his new book, Post-Growth, Life After Capitalism, which I had the opportunity to receive from uh, Polity Press. Um, and I wanted to introduce uh, Tim because you are, of course, a, a, a very versatile uh, person. You are an ecological economist, but you also are a writer and a playwright. Uh, since 2016, you have been the director of the Center of um, in Understanding Sustainable Prosperity, so CUSP. Um, and you have degrees in mathematics, in philosophy, in physics. So quite a happy mix that I'm very curious to talk about later on. I'm glad you, I'm glad you think that's a happy mix. <laughs> it's, it's perhaps a rather strange mix for an economist. Well, I think this tells a lot about how you write as well. Uh, and you are the author, of course, of Prosperity Without Growth, which is a book that has influenced a lot of people, including me. So I read it 10 years ago, uh, back when it was a report, before it was a book. Uh, and it helped me kind of explore with the relationship between material flows, GDP, prosperity, and how they're interlinked. And so I had the pleasure to read this book, uh, which is a, hist it, it's a mix between history of economy, capitalism, uh, science, philosophy, and um, a manifesto of how to build the next economy. Uh, so it's a, a really inspiring book and you can find quotes of the Beatles, of Boltzmann, of Aristotle, Shakespeare, Stuart Mill and many others in order to better understand what the good life is and what motivates us. So with all that being said, thank you very much team for being part of this podcast and it's congratulations of your, on your inspiring book. Thank you. Um, could you perhaps just give a short introduction of yourself, tell us a bit more about the rationale behind this book uh yeah i i guess uh, you know in a way in a way i'm i started out with with circular economy and writing about circular economy um i guess kind of back in the late 1980s early 1990s and i, I wrote a book uh, in the mid 1990s called material concerns which really tried to draw together a lot of the technological understanding of a of a circular economy um, and situated it in our sort of search for the good life as well, if you like. Um, and, and it was really out of that work and out of my sort of exploration of the, the limits of technology that I began to question the economic model more and more. And I found myself in uh, the early 2000s as economics commissioner on the Sustainable Development Commission, which reported to the UK prime minister. And I sat down very early with the chair of that commission and said, you know, what should I best spend my time on while I'm in the commission? And, and the result of that actually was prosperity without growth. It was kind of, we both decided it was a good time to have a, a, a serious look at the most obvious tension that we face as a human species, which is an expanding economy into a finite planet doesn't go. And it's, it's almost so simple, you know, that the kids can understand it and, and certainly lay people can understand it. It's, it's generally harder for politicians and economists. <laughs> because of the but dogma somehow, yeah. Yeah, um, and, but also because economists have a very different view. They, they're not rooted so much in the physical world and they think that economic value isn't necessarily rooted in the physical world either. Um, and there's, they do point, you know, up to a point that's, that's true. Economic value is not the same thing as material throughput. And therefore, if you can continually dematerialize your economy, make it lighter and lighter, um, then, then you do have a chance. In principle, you have a chance of expanding your economy without, without trashing the planet. The, the, the difficulty is we've, we've never done it. The, the challenge of doing it is absolutely enormous. And almost all of the, the triggers of the economy push in the wrong direction. And so that's really, you know, when, when I came to write Prosperity Without Growth, that was kind of the analysis that I, that I um, developed during that. I had lots of 
mathematics in there, lots of looking at statistics, lots of thinking about the data, lots of empirical work. It was written as a policy report for a prime minister. Now, I'm not saying that prime minister, prime minister was very happy to receive the report. <laughs> he wasn't at all. In fact, I had a just before it went out, I had a phone call from someone uh, close to the prime minister's office who told me that he'd, he'd gone ballistic um so it was it was not a welcome report at all it but but it nonetheless it set out um a com it began a sort of conversation actually i think that people have been um wanting to have so even though you know our policy paymasters if you like were not very pleased to see the report and kind of wished it would go away um there came an enormous audience for that report suddenly out of nowhere after a week or so of complete dead silence deafening silence in which the policymakers tried to pretend it wasn't there and after that it just got downloaded you know over and over again by all sorts of people all over the world who wanted to have that conversation about whether uh, a growth-based economy is really the right direction of travel what else is there how do we manage that tension and really think differently about the kind of society that we want to have but as I say, um, it, it was a policy report to policymakers, and so it was written in policy language. And, and a few years ago, a couple of years ago, I had a conversation with someone for whom, like you, that report had been very influential, who sort of said to me, look, Tim, it's absolutely great. This kind of changed the way I think about my work. In fact, he left his job because of... Um, <laughs> not sure he thanks me for that, but he left yeah. his job... <laughs> for for you know f from having read the book and and sort of said but i think i think it i think you need to make this more accessible to more people and so post growth is partly about that it's partly actually a response to that conversation and and a sort of recognition actually that that policy language is not always the most accessible for ordinary people and that actually there's another job to be done which is to think about our lives from a from the perspective of ordinary everyday people who don't think in policy terms don't want data i remember my mum saying to me at one point well there's a lot of graphs in it aren't there tim <laughs> and i was like yeah mum that's the point but actually you know for someone someone who was an intelligent human being who who could understand the philosophical points actually Th those those that way of talking gets in the way and I wanted to bypass that I wanted post-growth to be a book which talked about ideas and talked about philosophies but did it in a way that told stories that people could understand and and that connected them therefore to what I think is actually a long long train of thought that there are better ways to live there's a different way of organizing society that it isn't just all expand expand and neither is it all fight 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 it's not all about competition and i wanted i wanted post growth to really to draw those together and to present if you like a portrait of a different way of thinking about society but, but it's funny yeah i think that the prosperity without growth also helped people like me, which were very data oriented, very dry to get a glimpse of hope uh, out of, you know, because we, we have reports since uh, the 1970s with limits of growth and all that, that tell us that we're, well, we cannot continue in the same way. So that was a given, but you added the word prosperity, you added the word well-being, you added some extra notions that give us hope that tells us, well, we're fighting for something. We're not just fighting for, well, we're fighting for survival, but we're also fighting for the good life. And we're fighting for, you know, something optimistic at the end of the day, which uh, I find very reinvigorating. And I think in this, you, you also help people that are not interested into data, as you said, to understand that there, there are figures behind this. It's not just wishful thinking. It's not just you know, an optimist uh, uh, writing a manifesto to, uh, to to do civil disobedience. It's more, uh, well, even if uh, you, you kind of call for it because we are in, stuck in within a system, there is science behind it. And uh, I think... No, I think that I agree. I think that's really important too. I think it's, it's, a, it's a, to me, it's sort of, uh, and it is partly because of what you said about where I come from. You know, I'm a kind of mathematician on the one hand but I'm a playwright on the other and 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 actually I think you kind of need both both those things to 
to um, to kind of make progress and to deepen our levels of thought about where we're going. So, where did your obsession with growth started? Uh, you know, you you have well, yeah. I d- <laughs> you call it an obsession, Aristide. Um, I I um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how, how obsessed I am with growth. I mean, actually, I'm a big fan of the GDP. It seems a really weird thing, but I think it's a clever construct from a, from an intellectual point of view because it brings together so many different parts of our economy fits them into a puzzle and so if you want to understand how an economy works then the gdp can tell you something about it and and i think you know what what's gone wrong is the idea um that the gdp and the growth in the gdp is the only thing that we should be aiming for and and i suppose you know in, in my early work interestingly in some of the early work i remember a report that i did very very early on for friends of the earth I basically admitted that we had to present our solutions in the context of a of a GDP that was growing. I, you know, you can you can go back and find it. it was written in '99. It was a piece of work on the relative um, carbon intensities of different energy technologies. And basically, what we said was, you know, you can reduce this carbon and stay and still keep your two percent growth target or whatever it was at the time. I don't remember. And 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 so I did. St- you know, I did start out accepting that that dogma, um, and and it was really only when I began to think about why things why things weren't changing that I began to question the dogma. I, get, I began to go back to that and say, you know, is that correct? And then one day, you know, I, I stumbled on uh, the index of sustainable economic welfare, which Daly Herman Daly and John Cobb had put together with Clifford Cobb um, in their book for the common good, and 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 it really it, it was. To me, I mean, I am someone who likes those kind of pictures and, and, and responds to those graphics. And it was a very, very clear picture. It was a picture of GDP going up and up and up over 50 years and of the index, which they had constructed to reflect welfare, going up for a certain time and then beginning to flatten off and actually decline over the years. And and it was such a graphic illustration, that division of those two lines. Yeah, GDP can go up and up and up, but actually well-being is not doing the same thing. And and so one of my first instincts was, you know, I want to do that for the UK. And I did it for the UK. And then we did it for Sweden. And we contributed to, you know, a collection of indexes of sustainable economic welfare, lots and lots of lovely graphs, mum, which, which showed, you know, began to show the same thing that although we were getting more GDP, we're getting bigger economies. That wasn't making the world a better place. And and that, I think, was the point at which, you know, I began to um, then understand that we had to confront that as a societal challenge and take it seriously, not just to say, you know, that's it. We don't need growth anymore. Forget it. But because that's not a solution either, in an economy in which everything is built around growth. So we have to, in a sense, see it as as a task, as a task to unpick our own dependency on this growth in the GDP and to figure out how to do things better. A lot of that actually was in prosperity without growth and, and the kind of thinking about the economy, thinking about enterprise, thinking about investment, thinking about the money system itself, thinking about all of those things and how you do them differently. That was kind of laid out in in principle in Prosperity Without Growth. And it's part of what CUSP, my research centre, is exploring in in all sorts of ways, economic ways, philosophical ways, sociological ways, psychological ways, political science research that we do there is all dedicated to this task of actually teasing us out of this gross dependent society and thinking about a different way to build things. And, and then post-growth, the book is a kind of homage to that idea written, hopefully, and, and you know, from what you said, I've been partly successful at least, in a way that people can grasp it as a story, as a, as a meaningful story, and, and, and as the beginnings of a conversation about a different kind of society and and so in a way it kind of if you like it was never an obsession with growth it was first of all it was yeah growth is kind of the frame in which I have to do my work second is why is it the frame I have to do my work third is actually we're in a really difficult societal challenge here and fourth is you know a place where even though I've called the book post growth actually it's a place of flight where we can flee from the assumptions of the past and and 
and free ourselves to imagine a different kind of future. It's it's funny because I, I really enjoyed also the, the side stories kind of things that you have all around the book. And so you start with uh, the story of, uh, uh, of um, was it Robert? I always forget. Robert Kennedy. Yeah, yeah Robert Kennedy. Mm. Um, and it was in 68, of course, at the same time in France, you had a massive uh, yeah. movement as well. And he was a proponent of post-growth, which was mind-blowing for me that someone from the U.S. would be someone like that. And, and, a, and a someone running for president. Yeah, I mean, exactly, I, I exactly. was Exactly. I mean, I was just, you know, I remember very distinctly, we were in the middle of doing, I think it was the UK Index of Sustainable Economic Wealth. Somebody discovered a recording of that speech at the University of Kansas. And, and it was, you know, for us as working on it, it was just, it was extraordinary. And we kind of, you know, almost had not known until that point that that recording was unearthed, that actually a someone running for president of the US had made the same point 40 years before, or it wasn't 40 years at that point, but it's now 47, 48. So. Of course, unfortunately, he was assassinated. So we never know what would have happened in case he was uh... 50 i'm sorry my maths you know my, i'm obviously in the i'm not being that it's, it's for those listening and paying attention 1968 is not 48 years ago it's 53 actually it's 53 almost exactly when he made that speech 53 years ago but then you went down the rabbit hole and you know you pulled the thread and you saw that his advisors were galbraith and then the advisor you know the phd advisor herman daly is galbraith Uh, if I understand correctly, and so there is this... not not quite, but the, but he was he, Galbraith was very very influential. Both ah, yeah, on yeah, yeah. Herman's PhD supervisor. No, no, and you, on you're right. Itself, so yeah, so, yeah. No, I was fascinated. I mean, I was like, why? How, where did this come from? In 1968, when growth rates were four and five percent per year, how come this guy comes along and says, actually, you know, growth not all is made out to be folks, and and so I was really fascinated by the ideas that I came from, and in some ways. Thinking about it now, I think I was a bit arrogant about it because, you know, we have an arrogance that in us about our own modernity. We think we are the most modern, most progressive, most forward thinking part of society because we're, we're at the cusp, we're at the forefront of it. So we must be the ones who are thinking best. Yeah. But actually, and that's one of the things I suppose about the stories in the book, the more you look, the more you find that actually these ideas have a legacy And that legacy is the legacy of incredibly thoughtful, intelligent, poetic people who have been there before us. And, 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 and that's a part of what I wanted to do. And it's, you know, when I began to discover the sort of roots of that speech that Robert Kennedy made, it, it really reinforced that point for me that we are sort of engaged in a, in a kind of ongoing conversation about the kind of society that we want. And yes, People have been there before us. So they have talked about those things. There's enormous knowledge locked up in history books, which is which is bad because not many people like yeah. history books that much. But it's but it but it's you know if you can bring that alive and tell those stories, then then we can connect ourselves not just to to a future that we want, but to a past that's already been supporting us, even though we didn't know that we were being supported by these long dead people. Yeah, and even, I mean, it seemed like a crime investigation when you went down the, this path. And it's funny that, well, Herman Daly was writing his uh, article at the same time, more or less of the speech, and these were not correlated. And it's, that's also yeah. Yeah, human weird, condition. It? Yeah. It's it, almost like we're living inside a program, do you think? No, I'm not going that far. But I mean, that's kind of, you know, that's Elon Musk territory, I guess. But <laughs> Soon, it's, wait for it. Yeah. yeah, wait for it. <laughs> wait for it. But it's, but it is, you know, there were moments during that, during the writing of the book and during this exploration of ideas when I, when I, it felt so connected, those ideas across time and, you know, through uh, accidental occurrences of the same thing at the same time, like Herman Daly's paper and Bob Kennedy's speech. And, and I asked Herman himself, because I was fascinated, because I've met him a couple of times and I know him reasonably well because of the work that we've done. And so I asked him, you know, did you, did you know about the speech at the time? And he said, no, I had no idea. 
which makes it even more extraordinary in a way. But but there is a kind of sense, of course, in which you know ideas have their time in history and and appear in different places. And and so you know maybe something like that was going on. And then of course there were common sources. So the most obvious one was Rachel Carson's mm -hmm. uh, Silent Spring. Of course. And 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 John Kennedy, who was Robert Kennedy's brother, was a, was a huge supporter of Rachel Carson. So already in the DNA, actually, of the kind of Kennedy presidency, there was um, there was this care, this this concern for the environment, and and a reflection on the kind of economy that we had and the kind of society we were becoming, and and a lot of support for what I would now call, and you would probably now call, post growth ideas. Mm. So that was that was you know it was a part of the kind of fascination of of looking at, at these different people well it also gives a legitimacy to you know these thoughts you're not just a radical uh thinker that out of the blue uh, you know pulled the post growth out of your hat and that is it. it it exists for a long time there are philosophical values there are economic values there's a number of values that have existed and we just need to reshape them remake a puzzle out of old pieces more or less and make sense of our current contemporary challenges because the challenges are similar you know over the, the ages we had environmental challenges we had societal challenges uh but we kind of keep on pushing trying to change more or less what is happening with more or less success but uh it, it's also you know a, a route it's not new all of this we're, we're really I think you also had the, um, the lockdown and the pandemic at the epicenter of your book as perhaps a trigger or perhaps a, a revival of some old instances. I don't know how it was. Um, it was impossible really to write, to write that book at that time without at least partly anchoring it in, in, in the pandemic, partly because most of it was written in lockdown, mm. but also because it is of course the most extraordinary thing to happen, not just to, Uh, our economy but to our society as a whole um you know definitely in our our lifetimes my lifetime which is a little bit longer than yours and indeed you know m almost anyone alive has, has not really been able to kind of remember anything quite so extraordinary and our kids are you know they're, they're going to be living through and hopefully prospering after one of the most extraordinary events in the in the certainly in the last century so so there was no sense in which i could kind of write the book without thinking about the the the, the pandemic even though i started writing before um yeah. it it sort of inevitably seeped into the way that i was thinking about the book and 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 and, and also because it's had some really extraordinary lessons for the way that we think about the economy you know it's really has turned so many things on its head Um, first of all, most obviously, I suppose that, you know, when push comes to shove, it's not wealth that matters so much as health. And, and that's a that's a change in viewpoint. You know, it's a it's a real switch in viewpoint. And it happened a year ago. We stopped prioritizing wealth and we began to prioritize health and governments did what they had to do. And they did it more or less overnight. And they did it without yeah. any restrictions yeah. and they paid for it yeah. through, um, you know, mechanisms that they denied had ever existed. And so we kind of in a way, in a way, it, it was, um, you know, it was it was it was giving us lessons about a post growth economy in a way that no book ever could. And and that was so inevitably, you know. I think there were there were lots of there were lots of um, very key influences there. And then there was also this this other thing, which about the pandemic, I think, which is that it's taught us it's taught us something at least about ourselves as human beings, and and you know not just about the things that matter, but also about the things we struggle with. The, the, the lockdown, in some sense, is a is is a kind of you know huge metaphor for the the our own mortality and the temporality of our lives and that there are certain kinds of limits on us and that the way that we respond to those limits is really 
almost like our existential task. You know, it isn't an accidental thing that comes just because we have a pandemic and because we have to suddenly deal with an unexpected situation. There is a sense in which, and this was kind of, I mean, this is obviously my learning out of the pandemic. It's not everybody's, but it was certainly, it sort of reflected back at me in a sense that, that you know, <clears throat> ultimately our battle against limits is an existential one. And, and we, we have a choice in that. We either sort of try to bounce our way out of it and bound free, you know, in one bound he was free and pushing at the frontiers of, I don't know, anything from, from overseas holidays to Mars, if you are of a certain kind of understanding about the frontier of human ingenuity. And, and, and yet in, there are still limits to that and there are limits to how, how many people can participate in that. We might get if we're lucky, a few people to build a colony on Mars, but that's not about the lives and livelihoods and health of 8 billion people on planet Earth. And it's not about the quality of our environment. And so, so there's, you know, if we, if we retreat from that frontier mentality and draw our sights back towards Earth, towards ourselves, towards the inner part of the human psyche, what do we find there? And it's one of the one of the most extraordinary things is that we've lost sight of that journey, that inner journey. It seems to me, you know, we've been so focused on that outer journey. We've been so focused on that innovation. We've fo been so focused on the outer frontier that we've neglected parts of what it is to be human. And and in in a way, I think it's the same process that we've neglected our own history. If you're continually innovating, if you're continually searching for the new, you're not looking back anymore. You're not looking at the understandings of our grandparents. And therefore we're losing the wisdom of, of that history itself brings to inform our lives. And, and they're two, they're sort of two, you know, two sides of the same coin in a way, those things, that continual innovation loses sight of history and continually bursting for the frontier loses sight of the of the inner game, if you like, one of the books that I cite in there, in pursuit of a a kind of a quality which, in, in psychology, is called flow, the ability to really focus on something and concentrate on something, and be carried away from it. And and I I was first introduced to that interestingly through playing tennis. There's a wonderful book called The Inner Game of Tennis, and it's, it's it says a very obvious, very straightforward thing to someone, anyone who plays any kind of sport, that m most of it is happening inside your head your your sporting ability is partly but only partly about the physical and about what you can physically achieve and and most of it is happening inside your head and that's where the battles are being fought that's where you fall apart when everything goes wrong and that's when when it goes right you really can achieve these kind of states of mind which go outside of the ordinary so in a way it's almost it's bizarre in a way that that by coming back from the frontier and focusing in what's inside us, we actually burst out way further than that, the, the imagination of that frontier that we had in the first place. This is not physically going to Mars. And, you know, hands up to the people who have landed Perseverance Rover on the surface of the Red Planet. It's a fantastic achievement. But there are other achievements that are more accessible to all of us. And, and it was it was a part of what I wanted to do was to, 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 to lay before people the possibility of that inner journey. It is it doesn't cost anything, it isn't material intensive, it doesn't give you instant gratification, but it's a part of our or almost a part of the soul of society. And it connects us to other people in ways that a competitive, materialistic, hedonistic lifestyle. Well, it depends if uh, you're heliporting to Davos, as you as you mentioned. I, 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 you know, I have to say, if that's got to be a blast, hasn't it? That's got to be does, a real. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I think. But we're not going to do it because it's so bad. <laughs> not all of us. <laughs> not all of us. That's true. You know, there's not there's not room for eight billion people on uh, clusters. <laughs> but um, 
I, I find it funny that I, I wanted to address this flow state because I think it's the point that, con that I connected most with your book uh, because I, I... I'm really happy to hear you say that because there's some people who think, what the f is this guy on? I mean, actually, some people who know me quite well found that flow stuff quite difficult to uh, quite difficult to take. So I'm, I'm happy, Aristide, but yeah, go on. Well, I mean, I'm an avid uh, surfer, Okay. Or, so you exactly. Yeah, so you know. I, I experienced this, or going to the mountains as much as possible. I experienced this, also how difficult it is to to learn something when you're in your late twenties, thirties, to discover from scratch and to battle your own youth behind you in order to, you know. And I find the the oh, man the happiness. Your youth of, is yeah. not, your, your youth is not behind. <laughs> Believe me, you know, there's nobody else listening. Your youth is not behind you. No, no, I know, but I, mean, is. I, I've, I have friends that learned, you know, skiing and surfing and all I that know what at you're 10 saying. years old. I, do, and... yeah. I know, I know, I know. You're not going to do that again. That's true. <laughs> and I feel I've learned so much through it and it's except, well, perhaps it's the, the moments I'm the most happy when I'm with family and when I, you know, I'm in the ocean and feel alone. It's the only times where you can disconnect with, you know, the vanity and, you know, writing the paper that's, or that's whatever. That's the yeah. interesting thing. That's the interesting thing to me. It's not, you know, I, I introduced it and it emerged in my life in relation to a very specific thing, which was tennis. Um, but, but actually, when you go looking for it, you find it in all sorts of places. And as you say, you know, family and social environments is one of the places where people do experience flow. And we actually, some of the work we've done in CUSP is kind of, identified some of those areas where where you can achieve that flow and they're very very different from each other some of it is physical exercise some of it is craft and being absorbed in a task some of it is social and in the presence of of, of other people some of it is meditative contemplative and so you know i guess this in a way there's something in there for everybody yeah certainly and that's it should, yeah, and that's kind of, I mean, in a way, isn't that what we're looking for? We're looking for, you know, not a good life, one size fits all, that everybody's got to do this, do that, and do the other, but actually something that is free to everybody, available to everybody, that that can create opportunities for everyone. And, uh, and that, you know, I think that's that's why that's why that concept is is in there. And it's investment to yourself, as you mentioned it in this, which takes a lot of time. Um, so if I had to synthesize your book, you, you kind of do it yourself at the very last chapter. You say that more is not always a virtue. Struggle is not only basis for the only basis for existence. Competition is not the only response to struggle. Uh, and then you say that productivity doesn't exhaust the return to work. Investment is not a meaningless accumulation of financial wealth. This denial is not the only response to our mortality. And so... Are these the precepts of uh, post growth, or how would you, if you had to, to give you know some pointers towards the? I think they're the foundations of post capitalism in a way. They're kind of you know the, all of those things really were saying were, were kinds of things that 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 um, if you like they 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 opposed the dogma that capitalism imposes on us that work is a form of slavery that productivity is all that it's about that you know investment is a kind of casino where we gamble and the, the winner takes all you know the the structure of late capitalism has imposed a set of dysfunctionalities on human society and and in that in that phrase in that passage that you just read i'm just kind of pointing that up really that the journey of the book shows actually what a poor conception of work, for example, lives inside capitalism. And that, that there is actually one, and it's the one that I draw from Hannah Arendt in the book and her philosophy. There is one which actually is very much about the enrichment of, of the human soul and the security of our sense of self and our participation in society. And, and we've given these goods up to the service of of a capitalism that that just sees rapacious growth as its output and efficiency as its only core uh, driver, and and so I, you know I guess by the time you've read, you're reading that at the end of the book I guess that's what I'm hoping people will 
will understand, but understand not in a, you know, kind of, you know, intellectual, here's my argument way, but in the, in a, in a sense of all, of all of that history of ideas and the ways in which that's been explored in our very own cultural history. We're not trying to necessarily reinvent the whole world. We're actually drawing the threads of a different kind of narrative that already exists and has been laid down with extraordinary elegance by some of the most intelligent people. Um, and, and that, you know, I think as you mentioned at the beginning is, is to me is a kind of, you know, it gives me this sense, enormous sense of support. There've been moments in thinking about growth and challenging growth and when Prosperity Without Growth is first published where you kind of think, you know, God, I'm putting my head up above the parapet here and I'm just about to be shot. And that's not the case that, you know, that legacy of thought exists in our own culture and in other cultures. And, and it gives us actually the grounds, not just for thinking about and writing about post-growth society and not just believing in it either, but actually sensing it, feeling it and, and living it. Um, well, it feels very poetic, of course. So we, we're really looking forward to this uh, post-growth society. This podcast is mainly focused on cities. So I was wondering if you can find or how do you envision a post-growth city, given that cities are really the hub of consumption. So and the place of accumulation, the place of, you know, the surplus all of the surplus is uh, a cities exist through surplus. So have you ever thought of what would a city, a village, would it be a city? Would it be a village? What, what would be this post-growth territory or how would it look like? Do you have any idea? I, th I think it can, I think it can exist in different, in different places. I, you know, am I allowed to say that I don't really know the answer to that question? <laughs> I mean, I kind of have some inkling of it, you know, and I think in a way uh, there's, there's a lot of creativity at the moment about about visual visually imagining those places and and you know if you go to some of the some of the people who have begun to do that you find this sort of richness of imagery of the way that nature and city merge together the way that people and function work the way that work and life are put together the the, the energy dependencies of the city that that i think you know those visual images actually to me are incredibly powerful and they they answer your question a lot better i think than i could do in practice um you know in practice we know you know i could go back if you like to the sort of instruction manual of prosperity without growth and say uh, you know we have to know what the limits are we have to fix the economics we have to change the social logic all of those things are broken this is what you do with enterprises what you do with investment blah 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 uh, and i think all of those things are true in relation to rebuilding cities but i think in a way uh, to me a lot of the really interesting work um, there's two bits of interesting work. What one is one is the people on the ground who are actually doing it at city level, and then there's the the visionaries, if you like, the people who are imagining that, giving us stories, visual stories and cues about the kinds of places that we might be living in, and that's you know that's that's I think those are tasks which actually I, other people do much better than I do what I hope I've given to that in a way is is that 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 re-envisaging of the cities of the future is supported by a rich history of ideas which which actually is enormously liberating even though it starts from the idea that we might be living within certain limits <laughs> Uh, so two last questions before I leave you. Uh, now that you gave birth to this book, what will you do in 2021? What's your next? Uh, I, I, have a, I have a very specific task, actually, which I'm kind of working on with some researchers. I have to go and talk to them kind of right now, uh, which, is, which is, you know, it seems to me that if we're, if we're right, that one of the messages from um, the lockdown is that health is more important than wealth, then we have to make an economy of care work. 
And, and it's been difficult because of the structures of capitalism and most of the economics of care is not working properly. So that's, that's a quite specific project. And it, it, you know, it involves, it goes back in a way, you know, sadly, it tears me back into um, the mathematician and the, and the uh, philosopher and the policymaker and so on. But, but I, you know, it's, it's a task actually that, that is, is absolutely essential. And, and when you think about the people who basically saved our lives over the course of the pandemic, many of them were working in the health sector and yet they had been living, you know, under deprived conditions, precarious lifestyles, uh, productivity targets that made their work more and more difficult. And, and all of that is driven by the structure of the economies that, that we have. And so there's, there is a kind of urgent task, it seems to me, which is to, which is to find an economics and an economic structure of care and, and that, that allows us to create, not, not necessarily at this point, just a post-growth society, but a post-pandemic society in which the people who matter most are never again neglected in the way that they were in the time running up to the to the pandemic. I do enjoy graphs, so don't don't be shy with uh, with graphs. And it's and good, you know. Herman Daly has a wonderful thing which he calls misplaced concreteness, and it's just fantastic. I love it. I, you know, when you're sitting in front of a spreadsheet or 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 a computer model, the time goes by. You're in flow, and you never really have to worry too much about reality as long as you can produce some pretty graphs at the end of it. I like it. Uh, just the last question. So what, you already mentioned uh, a great variety of books of um, authors of the films as well. Is there anything that, uh, is there one book or one article, one video that you would like to recommend that embodies post-growth? I'm not sure really. I, uh, if there's, is there one, I mean, you know, it's really interesting to look at that video of, 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 Robert Kennedy, um, you know, the beginning of that video where he talks about the limitations of the, of the GDP. Is that available now somewhere? We it is. It's on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's a link in the, in the references. There should be a link in the references. Okay. Yeah. In the yeah. Book. And, and, and I did do that actually. There were come, there were kind of the points where I just felt, you know, actually the notes are as important as the, as the book for those who really want the detail, because there's lots of notes and there's lots of links. And actually almost as I think about the way that I wrote the book, it was by reference to a lot of visual material. So stuff that you can go, that is well archived and that you can go, um, hopefully the links are all still working from the notes in the book. But if you go there and there's a couple of, there's a couple of moments. So that moment with Bobby Kennedy was one. And then there's this moment, which I actually tried to write about in the book, because it's just an extraordinary moment to me of, of um, three days after Martin Luther King was shot, Nina Simone gives a, a wonderful concert and in the middle of this concert she it, it was just a sort of tribute to to king and 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 in the middle of it she just stops and she does this total ad lib comment on uh where things are on society on life on immortality and it's you know to me particularly as i was kind of looking at that in the middle of what emerged last summer the kind of black lives matter movement in particular and and realizing that the, the history of these ideas the history of these struggles is not one thing at one time but a continuous story that we are we are all engaged in and 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 each of those visual moments for me was was part of what anchored me to that idea that we're sort of living in a chain of being and the chain of ideas within that chain of being. And we're not individuals and we're not, we, we are, and we're not, you know, on one hand we can play wonderful tennis or, or, or surf in extraordinary ways, but, but at the same time, a part of our well being, an enormous part of our well being, comes from our connection to other people. And so I chose, I think I chose, you know, I chose lots of those videos to almost act as a kind of inspiration for me as I was writing and hopefully there'll also be a kind of resource for other people as well. Thanks so much for all your time, Tim. It was wonderful. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks. I hope we're going to meet uh, for some tennis or for some, some surf uh, in the oh, future. You got, I'm, you know, are you going to teach me to surf really? Sure. That's sure, fantastic. Sure. <laughs> I've, I've always wanted to, but I've never actually 
stood up vertically on a surfboard yeah you don't need to to have fun so oh, okay yeah That's good. <laughs> so thanks everyone good as to well know. to to listen until the end if you like this episode please make sure to to share it with your friends and colleagues and i'm looking forward for your new report tim thanks a lot cheers bye